Well, hey, Jamie, so grateful that you would uh, carve some time out to spend with us. And so thanks so much for joining us here. Yeah, of course. Anytime I get to talk to awesome. Jason Johnson, I, I take Oh, it. please. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> don't give me that. So you, uh, <clears throat> we'll just cut straight to it. Uh, most people that are watching this or listening or interacting with us probably know who you are. But if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about who you are and in particular, uh, how you and your family and your kiddos got involved in all of this. Sure. So my name is Jamie Finn. I am the author of Foster the Family blog. From that, uh, I have a ministry that is also called Foster the Family, where we serve mm -hmm. our local community with emergency supplies and immediate care, but then also holistic long-term care, just through relationships, community mm -hmm. mentorship. Uh, I became a foster parent seven years ago, and okay. it was it was one of those, like, I always knew foster care existed. And I always knew that sort of in general, there was a need, but I didn't see what it had to do with me. And it wasn't really on my radar up close at all. But once it was, it was not going away. The, mm -hmm. the thought that there were children, you know, on my street, in my town, who were vulnerable, who were part of families, who weren't able to care for them the way they needed. It just, it kind of just took over my heart and eventually took over my life. And so now a lot of, of what I do day to day is caring for my kids, my foster children, my kids adopted through foster care and of course my two biological mm -hmm. kids, but then mm -hmm. caring for foster families, writing about foster care. It's, um, it's become a lot of what takes up my, my days yeah. and my heart. Yeah, well, and I, I can speak for me and I know for many, many others that we're grateful that it has because mm -hmm. you have become a voice for so many, a voice of reason and a voice of hope and a voice that helps many really reframe um, mm -hmm. some of their experiences um, mm -hmm. and points people back to Jesus and the hope that we have, even in the midst of circumstances that sometimes feel hopeless, you're, you're able to help people reframe how they process all of that. And so with that, you know, throughout this series, we're focusing on, on areas of this journey that might require us to reframe the way that we think sometimes, sure. and perhaps we're not seeing it clearly, or perhaps we're not viewing it from God's perspective. And so in your experience, what's an area of foster care and adoption uh, in the journey involved with that, that, that you find many people really need to reframe their thinking. And maybe you had to, and you see, oh, it, it wasn't just me, like a lot of people um, on this journey struggle in this area so that we're not just surviving the journey, but that we're thriving on it. Sure. Yeah, I'm glad that you said a way that I had to reframe too, because I am yeah. not sort of preaching from the pulpit here. It is, yeah. I had to reframe. I, I actually just had to sort of switch the way I answered that question because Hmm. I didn't care about vulnerable families when I got involved in foster care. What I cared hmm. about was just the kids. Okay. And so coming into foster care for me was there are these poor kids who need someone and I can be that person. And unfortunately, I operated in that way for a little while before I feel like God just rescued me from that and rescued me from the arrogance of I can come in and give these kids what they've never had and sort of save them from this situation to a place where now for me, foster care is not about children. It's about families. Um, and just reframing is such a good word from how can I rescue a child from a situation, bring them into my home and fix it to how can I enter this situation, come alongside of this family, partner within this broken system, and really that it's about vulnerable families, not just about vulnerable children. Mm. You know, and you, you brought up, how can we thrive in this journey? I think it's, it's the same answer. It's if you are operating within a system that exists to reunify families and support families, and you're coming in with this, well, bring me all the kids and I'm going to rescue them and, and let me build my family and adopt all the children. And it's personally frustrating to operate in a system that exists in one way, but then we kind of have these personal 
ulterior as much as we want them to be pure these right. other motives that that don't really coexist with what foster care is mm -hmm. so i think so many frustrated discouraged heartbroken foster parents yes the system is heartbreaking the work is heartbreaking but also when we are holding a goal that is not really the goal of foster care then it's heartbreaking and so right. i think as much as we can reframe the perspective of this isn't just about bringing kids out of their homes and into ours, but it's about us entering this broken system, vulnerable families, and coming alongside to support the family that God created. Hmm. That's so good. And as you're talking, uh, not to over-spiritualize things, you know, but as you're talking, it, it very vividly reminds me of the ministry of Jesus. And, you know, there's times in life in seasons in life where I think sometimes we say, God, why don't you just fix this? Like you could just snap your fingers and fix it all, but that's not how he chose to engage. Instead, he entered in right. to our story and he, he, he wrapped himself up in all of the mess and all of the brokenness. He, he could have maybe much more easily just snapped his fingers and tried to fix it and yeah. pull us away from everything that's hard and everything that's broken. But but like you're saying, his his posture was, I'm going to immerse myself in it for, right. for the renewal of all things. And when you share that perspective, that's what I that's what I hear. Yeah. yeah. And I think you've really helped to teach me this connection that in that story, we are not to just stand in the place of yes, now we enter the brokenness. But that where that story begins is where we were the broken and mm -hmm. we were rescued from that. And so right. even there, we can be tempted. I think I would have believed all of that seven years ago, but still have been tempted to come with a savior mentality. Like, yeah, Jesus entered. And so now I will enter. But wait a second. The story starts with Jesus entering our brokenness right. and us mm -hmm. having much more in common with our kids' families than we maybe yeah. would like to admit. And so when we right. start there, we've received the grace and now we can be instruments of that grace. Mm -hmm. And again, you've really taught me that a lot. So I'm grateful well, for that. You know, so to that point, what do you say um, to a family? I, I've never met a foster family who has said, I have everything that it takes to do everything that's needed. Sure. Uh, sign me up, you know. Um, on the contrary, I, I mostly meet foster parents who on some level say, I just don't know if I have what it takes. Yeah. The need is overwhelming. The, the trauma is overwhelming. The need for healing. What would you say to a parent right now who feels like it's just not working? Um, mm. I signed up for this, but this isn't what I signed up for. And I'm not able to fix. I'm not able to heal. Mm. And I don't know if I'm able to continue on this journey. Mm. All right, well, let's start with the spiritual piece. We glory in our weaknesses. In our weakness, there we are strong. His power, not ours, his power is made perfect in our weakness. And so sometimes it's, it's not comfortable to feel weak. And so sometimes when we're brought to a place where we feel weak and we're very aware of our need, we think this must not be how it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. right? I stepped into this with faith. So along with that faith should come the favor of obeying. And so we can assume, well, because it's hard, it shouldn't feel this way because it's hard. It must not be right. I must not be doing something right. Where really God loves to bring us to places where we come to the end of our rope, where in our weakness, his power is made perfect because he receives glory from that. And we receive grace from him in that. So Part of it is don't buck against that feeling as awful as it feels because it's it's part of the journey, it's part of the blessing and it's part of how God receives the glory. Yeah. But I don't think we have to be martyrs either where we just say like, yeah. well, let's you know just sacrifice and it's, it's gonna be hard. Um, and so I would beg the question, do some of the questions that are coming up actually have answers? And are you so sort of in the thick of everything that you haven't even allowed the space for those questions to really be asked and for the answers to be explored? 
So I, you know, I used to say I thrive in chaos. Now I'm trying to change that to saying I, I crave chaos. And so I lived for so long in survival mode and mm -hmm. just thought, well, this is how it's supposed to be. You just, you know, we are on a mission here and right. there are all these kids and they need us. And so we are going to live in survival, but mm -hmm. that didn't lead to me loving my kids. Well, it didn't lead to me loving the Lord. Well, it didn't lead to me loving others. Well, and so started to really ask the questions and, of, and maybe maybe even yourself taking care of yourself sure, well, I'm exactly. not assuming that not saying you uh, you in general i'm not saying jamie you didn't take well, care of yourself. but also me <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i and i've seen it play out for me and, and others sure. as well so yeah yeah go yeah so i for me it was about creating space to start mm -hmm. to see the questions as potentially having answers. You know, trauma, we just look at it sometimes and go like, oh, trauma, what do you do with it? Well, there are some answers to those questions of what you do with it. And mm -hmm. oh my gosh, my kids always need me and there's no downtime. Well, we, we start to like accept a reality that may actually have some practical answers that if we can look in humility can start to find some of the answers. Mm -hmm. So for each person, I think the answer is going to be very different. And so what I can offer is the, the idea of finding space. Find okay. space where you sit in those questions, where you seek the Lord, where you ask other people for input. And where instead of just saying, this is always hard, we start to say, well, what is hard? And what tools could I bring in? And in this situation, you know, getting out the door every morning is hard. Okay, so what practical reward systems or waking up earlier? Like right. some things do have practical answers. And I think our lives, our lives are so kind of chaotic and nuts sometimes that we just go like, well, it's chaos instead of right. taking the space to really consider if there are answers. Hmm. That's so helpful. And I, on a certain level, I think we see this again, here I am. I'm, I promise I'm not trying to be overly spiritual, but again, you talk and it reminds me of these instances in scripture, in the gospels, in the ministry of Jesus, where there's so much activity going on and the work is never ending. I mean, uh, but there's these really beautiful strategic moments where Jesus says, all right, guys, see you later. I'm going to the mountains yeah. or hey, I'm going to go over here and sleep, yep. but I need you guys to stay awake and watch guard so that nobody comes and wakes me up. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then there's even a really kind of heavy season of, of ministry where John the Baptist has just been murdered and, uh, and, and the grief of that, but then the celebration of the disciples are seeing amazing things happening as they've been sent out by Jesus. And so there's this really crazy mix of grief and joy and ministry yeah. and yeah. Jesus is, um, invitation to them was, hey, come away with me for a little while and, and let's just rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I love what you're saying is give yourself permission to create that space. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that Jesus doesn't say, just keep going, keep trucking, you know, yeah. power through. Uh, there's times he says, no, why don't you go to the mountain by yourself for a little while? Like, it would do everyone some good if you went away to the mountain for a <laughs> little while. like my husband to me. It would do everyone some good if you just hide in your room for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Hey, here's a couple hours. Go to Target or go do yeah. whatever. You, we need you to leave yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the things I love what you're encouraging us with is is give yourself the permission to do that. Like to, yeah. to create, to find that space, ask those questions. It's not selfish, um, and, you know, in practical ways for people that care for themselves sometimes can feel selfish. No, the need is overwhelming mm -hmm. and, and I'm on a mission. Um, I can't mm -hmm. focus on myself. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So to that point of, of this mixed bag of grief and joy and disappointment and excitement and struggle and, and breakthrough, and we see beautiful things happen and hard things happen. And that's just the essence of this journey. Um, uh, how how do you encourage people or how would you encourage people to navigate the grief in the midst of the joys and in the midst of the calling and the passion that they have? How have you found that to play out for you? And um, how would you encourage encourage others in those in those seasons of really mixed bags of emotions and feelings? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty deep in one right now. And 
it's it is a mixed bag. So here yeah. we are. We just um, said goodbye to our daughter of over two years, and wow. we were really involved with her mom and with supporting their family. And so here we are with this success story. You know, we we did the job well and, and we played a part. And mom says, I could have never done it without you. And we were a part of this whole thing. This is what this is about. This is about families being healed and parents being supported and kids being with their families. And, and we did we did our job well. And now we are just kind of left in the wreckage of it. And so I'm very aware of the fact that there is great joy and celebration in what we just played a part of in this amazing work that God did in healing this family. And also we are left with our emotions here. And it's really challenging. It's really hard to have the pain of that while also sort of celebrating. I mean, also very much so celebrating, but very much so grieving. So I'm learning this. I'm learning what it looks like to do this. But what I'm learning is that feelings are there to be felt, that feelings are not wrong, that we should allow space to feel them completely, but that there's a difference between our mind and our heart. And so I can feel sadness, feel disappointment, feel grief, but also have a guarded mind. You know, we, we talk, the Bible talks about guarding your heart, but the scriptures about guarding your heart are always in the context of our thoughts. And so really it's more about guarding our thoughts. So our emotions are not something we need to guard against. We don't need to guard against the feelings. It's the thoughts. And so I can have a day where I'm crying, where sadness is overwhelming and where grief is there, but where the thoughts are still filled of faith that this is what God had, that God has the best for our daughter and her mom, that God has a good plan for us. You know, someone messaged me the other day and said, aren't you angry? And I thought about it and I was like, you know what? I, I'm not angry. I'm disappointed and I'm feeling some of these things, but the thoughts there aren't angry. They're not sort of raging against why is this? Because yeah. this idea of of guarding your thoughts, taking every thought captive to Christ. It's there that we can like wrestle with the truths of who God is and what he's done. And we can find peace even in the midst of really challenging emotions. So the emotions come up, but then the thoughts are just full of of what I believe, even though it's not necessarily matching what I feel and what I believe can be hopeful and faith filled, even if it's not in, in line with the feelings of just mm. sadness and grief. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, scripture says we're, we're pushed down we're we're, um, we can be attacked from every side, you know, but, but um, it's not without hope. It's right. Um, perplexed, yeah. but not crushed. Not I love crushed. that. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. perplexed. I'm especially, you know, we're in a situation where we thought that we would continue to be involved and that was the plan all along and it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm perplexed. You know, I built with mom. I did everything I was supposed to do for two years and mom had all the intentions of us being involved. And so, yeah, I'm perplexed. I, I don't get why this is playing out this way. And yet there's a hope because I believe in who God is. I believe in what he's doing in this situation, even when the situation itself is, is painful and confusing. Hmm. I know so many can relate to that and we appreciate you 
sharing. Uh, I want to end our time talking about a project that you've been working on and that is in the works and will soon soon be released. Uh, obviously, many people know that you are a writer, author at Foster the Family blog. We're going to make sure that all the links uh, that people need to find you and to get to you are in the comments. But also, you have written a book that is due to come out sometime next year, uh, which I know so many will be excited about. Uh, so I'm curious, um, that's, not a, that's not a light load. You've just shared all the different things that you're, you and your family have been navigating through and somewhere in the midst of all that, you were able to sit down and, and write a book. Um, you didn't have to, uh, your life could have gone on had you not ever done it, but uh, I'm positive you felt called to, you felt like this was something the Lord wanted you to do and so you were faithful to that and I'm curious, why? Like, what's your hope for the book? Why do, why do you feel that this particular space um, needs, needs this resource? What's your hope for it as it lands in people's hands and in their hearts? Yeah. So I, you know, when we enter a new season, you get married, you have children, you go to college. There are so many resources that take the lessons learned by others from God's word, and they're there for you. And I found myself going to scripture and saying like, okay, the word foster care is not here. Adoption as it relates to us adopting kids is not here, but I know God that you speak to this. I'm confident that you are speaking to this season, to these struggles. And God was really faithful to meet me in his word. God was really faithful to, you know, as I'm dealing with an investigation that came from an accusation from a bio parent. Okay. God's word doesn't talk about investigations, but what does it talk about when we have enemies? All right. Now I, I am entrusting my kid to go on this visit where I feel afraid, where I'm not there to protect them. Okay. God's word doesn't talk about visits, but it talks about entrusting our children to him. It talks about how he's there and his presence can protect and provide comfort. And so I found in God's word, the lessons that, yep. that were coming on a daily basis of these struggles and trials. And I felt so grateful for voices like yours that had taught me. And I felt like there were a lot of practical lessons of foster care that God's word was speaking to and others were not feeling like they could find that others weren't having like the clarity of well, what is God saying to me in this? Mm -hmm. um, and so the book is a number of different topics and applying gospel truths, biblical principles to those topics and basically answering the question, well, what does God's word say about mm. how to do foster care as a foster yeah. parent? And it's, mm. it's living and active. It speaks to everything that we face. And that's what I found as I was going to his word personally, these lessons were there. And I, I felt uh, just convicted of sharing them with others and, and hopefully mm. providing that to others as well. Absolutely. What's the name of the book going to be? Or what is the name of the book? It's yeah. Foster the Family, and All right. it will be released next spring. So I'm really awesome. excited about it. Next spring, so spring 2022, yes. which is cra crazy to even think about. But yeah, I ask my husband almost every other day what year it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, especially after the last year we've had, yeah. no one really knows what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's awesome, and I know it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a um, a piercing kind of hopeful blessing for so mm -hmm. many. And I say piercing because it's going to cut right to mm -hmm. truth and what the heart of God says and what's true in the gospel. And piercing in the sense of in the midst of confusion or I don't know really what to think about this or how to feel about this. I am confident that mm -hmm. your book is going to help bring clarity. Uh, to people right where they need it the most. And so we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, so we're going to make sure that everyone can find you and that we've got the links uh, to that. And then we're going to wait for you when the time is right to share with everyone 
wh- how they can start finding out about the book and when it'll be coming out. And so we will wait with great anticipation for that. So Jamie, thanks so much for your time and your words of encouragement. Um, and if you're new to Jamie, be sure to follow her and check her out. And we know that uh, your journey will be that much better because of it. So thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jason. Absolutely. Awesome. Short Thanks. and sweet. Thanks so much. Do you feel like uh, anything was missed or everything's editable? So I don't, I don't want you to walk away and think I, he should have asked this or I should have said that. No, I mean, I had, I had more that I could say about self-care if you wanted yeah. to circle back to that. Yeah, sure. But, but I definitely <clears throat> didn't have to, I definitely, um, you know, I think that we hit good stuff. Okay, uh, maybe maybe just a few more minutes on that because I I haven't asked anybody else. Uh, okay. I didn't ask the schoolers or the or the calls about that, so that could be a great piece for this. That's not okay. any of the others. And so. I have like I have a workshop on it, so I have pretty organized thoughts about it. So. Great. Cool. <laughs> then let me let me try to pick back up. Um, sure, sure. So with that, Jamie, the idea of taking care of yourself and being healthy. What are some practical things that you often share with families in terms of, of self-care and soul care and really taking care of themselves? Sure. So I think every practical question needs to start with the foundational heart stuff. And so for me, that's where it was. I didn't need a list of tips of, you know, get a manicure or go do this by yourself. I think I needed to be convinced of why this was right, why this was God's heart for me. You know, I think I was really tempted to believe that anything with the word self in it was going to be selfish. And yeah, so that it wasn't there for me from God. And I, I love to say that that godly self-care is, it's motivated by love, it's driven by wisdom, and it's walked out in humility. So motivated by love, yeah, we we are loved by God, which means there's, you know, inherent worth in that. But let's even take it further than that is just loving our children. I don't love my children well when I'm exhausted. I don't love the people in my life that God has given me to love when I'm stressed out, when I'm physically weak and burnt out. And so we can be motivated by love for others to take care of ourselves. And then the driven by wisdom is believing that God created us as needy beings who are not self-sustaining, who have these needs for rest and food and water, really understanding that we are not God. And that we have these like inputs and outputs and rhythms that he created. And so for us to kind of ignore that as well, I don't have time for that is to ignore wisdom and to not embrace the way he made us to really be. And then walked out in humility. It's just believing that God rested, (laughs) that Jesus took time to rest. And so when we see that God rested and knowing that God is self-sustaining and that he wasn't, you know, recharging a broken body, we see that rest is in and of itself a divine discipline, that rest is in and of itself something that's worthy of pursuing and can be worshipful. And so when we have this foundation, I think then it can really speak to, okay, so what does it look like for me to actually do these things? When I become convinced and compelled that this is part of loving my family, this is part of being a human that God created, and this is part of worshiping him, then I don't allow myself to accept the answer of like, well, I just don't have time and there just isn't the space. You know, it the question demands an answer. And so I just don't have time might mean, well, I need to start paying someone to come and be with my kids so I can make this time. Or I need to find the humility to ask someone 
or beg someone to create this, this space so that I can take care of myself. And there will be different answers that can be ev- anything from doing something fun that makes you laugh and, and spending time with people to, you know, one of my self-care things that I think is the most bizarre, but the most fruitful for me is waking up super duper early. Hmm. And I hate waking up early. I never naturally woke up early, but when I wake up early, I'm alone. I'm alone Mm -hmm. with God. I'm exercising, which is helping my body and my heart and my mind. I'm thinking about my day. So I'm coming up with strategies for serving my kids. I'm starting off ahead instead of behind. I'm not catching up to my kids' needs. I'm starting off regulated and, and, you know, rested and ready for their needs. And so don't allow your conversation of self-care to be, well, I'm going on a girl's trip or, well, I'm going golfing or I'm having a glass of wine every night. Like, yeah, that might be part of it. Part of it is that we may have to rediscover what it looks like to find joy in the things that God created for us to enjoy. Um, But then part of it might be really mundane stuff like going to bed early and drinking Mm -hmm. eight glasses of water and waking up at four 30 in the morning, like whatever it is looking because you believe it's important because you're not allowing yourself to believe anymore. I don't have time for this. The mission is more important. The kids need me and there's just no space. No, there has to be. And once we're compelled and believe that there has to be, then we'll find the answers of what it actually means. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And it's so right on because there's a lot of other things that we believe. And, and so we go out of our way to act on those beliefs. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And so what what you're suggesting is not like this foreign concept that we're unfamiliar with. It's a matter of, well, I, I believe certain things about, I believe that, you know, Dr. Pepper is really good. And so I go out of my way to drink way too many of them every day. Like, right. So, you know, that's just a stupid example, but like you're saying, evaluating and just taking inventory of, of disciplines and rhythms and what do I really fundamentally believe and how can the decisions that I make reflect, uh, reflect that. That's, that's so, that's so good. Well, Jamie, again, we're grateful for you and for your time that you'd be willing to spend with us. And we are especially excited about spring 2022 when the book comes out. And so we will wait in anticipation for all the announcements that I'm sure that will come uh, leading up to that. Um, And I know that many others will be excited as well. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Jason.